And it is my great pleasure and honor to introduce to you our next presenter on the topic of From Green to Resilient, uh, Fred Kirschman, who is a distinguished fellow at the Leopold Center for Sustainable Development at Iowa State University and really one of America's leading uh, thinkers and practitioners on uh, greener approaches to agriculture. He's the president of the Stone Barn Center for Food and Agriculture, and he won in 2011 the James Beard Foundation Leadership Award. I give to you Fred Kirschman. Well, thank you very much. I hope that you can appreciate uh, the challenge that I have uh, because uh, resilience, uh, the case I'm going to make, is one of the most important things that we need to do now. And, uh, but it's a topic that unfortunately is not very well uh, incorporated into our culture. And so it really is going to take about an hour to do an adequate job of that. And I'm doing it in 15 minutes. So I hope you know this is not going to be the, uh, the uh, uh, premier performance that it should be, but I'm going to try to uh, raise at least the critical issues uh, that I hope uh, uh, you can uh, uh, take advantage of. And then I also want to uh, say that one of the other th the important things about this is that there are some resources available quite readily. And I'm not going to say this in terms of if you have time, but this, so this topic is so important to this whole issue that we're talking about that I hope that all of you would take advantage. And there is now a professional society, relatively young, but uh, a great professional society called the Resilience Alliance uh, that has produced a lot of really good material. And all you got to do is Google the Resilience Alliance and most of their work will come up. And then also there is a volume that two of the members of the Resilience Alliance... Uh, a volume that two of the members of the Resilience Alliance... <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. Uh, has published... Uh, Brian Walker and Brian Walker and David Salt, Brian and <laughs> and the title of the book is Resilience Thinking, and it's a very succinct, uh, clear indication of all of the issues that are involved in in the issue of resilience, and particularly, you know, how it applies not only to food and agriculture but to all of our human activities now as we move into uh, this new future uh, that we're all going to be a part of. So. Um, uh, the simple definition uh, for resilience is the capacity of, assistance, of a system uh, to absorb disturbances and still retain the basic function and structure. Okay, that's the basic concept of resilience. In other words, it's building into systems its capacity uh, to maintain its productive capacity. And uh, we're going to talk primarily about food and agriculture. So building into our food and agriculture systems the capacity uh, to absorb uh, disturbances without crossing a threshold into a different kind of function uh, so that it can continue to produce the kinds of goods and services that, that we need. And then there's a, a second part of that definition, that is, if in fact those disturbances do cross into a different kind of function, that we have the resources within the system and, frankly, the redundancy within the system so that we can continue to produce the, f uh, the goods and services, in this, in in this instance, food, uh, that continues to produce the food that we need under those new circumstances in that new restructuring of the system. So that's basically what uh, resilience is about. Now, the problem with our current food system, and I think, frankly, the problem with much of our discussions, not only here, but everywhere that I'm involved in discussions around food and agriculture, is that that whole concept is absent, even those of us who are part of sustainability movements and serious about sustainability, have only started to incorporate even the language of resilience in about the last two or three years. Mostly what we have talked about is how to green up the system. And when you talk about greening up a system, you're assuming that the system is going to remain relatively stable. And that's simply not our future. So we have to now convert from the notion of greening up a system, making it a little less bad. And a number of examples were used this morning. Uh, you know, no-till, which has certain advantages. Uh, integrated pest management, which has certain advantages. Those are all greening up, but they all assume that the basic structure and system of agriculture will remain relatively the same. 
And Joseph Fixel, who's a part of the resilience movement at Ohio State University, I think stated it, wow, what, we're really, what we've really been talking about in sustainability all this time is steady state sustainability. That everything's going to remain pretty much the same, and we just got to fix it a little bit. Uh, and that's not the future uh, that we're going to be uh, involved in. Now, the problem with our current food system is that we're also operating out of a single mandate. And it doesn't make any difference whether you're a farmer or a food processor or an input supplier. The one goal that you have to achieve is maximum efficient production for short-term economic return. And it really doesn't make any difference whether you're manufacturing automobiles or computers or underpants. You know, in our industrial economy, that's what you have to do. Maximum efficient production for short-term economic return. And then the means by which you do that, of course, as Henry Ford learned, you know, uh, 100 years ago in uh, manufacturing automobiles through an assembly line, is through specialization. You know, he once famously said that people can buy any car they want as long as it's a black Ford Model T, because that was the only one he was going to manufacture, because he was interested in that maximum efficient production for short-term economic return. So specialization, management simplification. You know, he didn't teach everybody to do, put a whole automobile together. He taught a lot of people to do one small piece of it, simplifying the system to gain those efficiencies. And then, of course, economies of scale. Now, agriculture was one of the last human enterprises to adopt that principle. And, it, you know, we can all argue why that was the case. Uh, there's something about the nature of farmers, uh, you know, who are a little skeptical about some of the new kinds of things, at least, at least they used to be. And um, so uh, the, uh, the, no the notion, uh, uh, but the notion that uh, you, we use these principles in agriculture really got adopted on a large scale after the Second World War. But now when you go into any agricultural community, and particularly true in Iowa, what you're going to see is that specialization, simplification, economies of scale. In Iowa now, 95% of our cultivated land is in just two crops, corn and soybeans. It meets that principle, and that's what we're doing. Okay. So, now, the big problem here is the kind of disturbances that we're going to see in the future, which is not going to enable this kind of specialization, simplification, economies of scale to be, quote, sustainable. And climate change is certainly one of those, but not the only one. I've identified at least eight, and let me just go through this very quickly, and I can't go into detail on them because of time. One is the end of cheap energy. Our current system, this specialized system, is enormously dependent on energy. We now use about 10 kilocalories of energy for every single calorie of food that we produce, the most least energy efficient that we've ever had. Okay? So now as energy costs go up, and there was a report from the United Nations just recently that indicated that every time the cost of oil goes up, the cost of food goes up at exactly the same rate. So imagine crude oil being $300 a barrel, $400 a barrel, because we're going to get there at some point. Then can we still do the kind of agriculture that we're doing today? And the answer to me clearly is no, we cannot. The second is that we're depleting our mineral and metal resources that have been critical for this. You know, we talked earlier about uh, fertilizers, rock phosphate and potassium. We're drawing down those resources all across the planet. And they're beginning now people to talk about peak phosphorus, and that we may in fact reach peak phosphorus before we reach peak oil. Now when phosphorus is no longer available or when it becomes so expensive that farmers can't afford it, how are we going to produce our food? Can't do it the way we're doing it now. And then there's fresh water. We're depleting our fresh water resources all across the planet. Seventy percent of our fresh water now is used just for agricultural irrigation. And one of the reasons that we use so much fresh water is because we're not paying attention to another depletion, and that's the biological health of our soil. We have, and the reason we're not paying attention to the biological health of our soil is because we've been using these external inputs to substitute. And so when you don't have biologically healthy soil, you're going to use a lot more water because the soil doesn't have the capacity to absorb and retain the amount of moisture that it needs to grow a crop. So we have to use a lot more irrigation. And then you've got, uh, of course, the unstable climates. And you know, we've all talked about that today. But you know, again, if you're going to have these huge monoculture systems, you have to have stable climates. If you're going to have 95% of your cultivated land in Iowa and corn and soybeans, you consistently need climate weather that's favorable to corn and soybeans. That's not our future. And then you have the loss of biodiversity and genetic diversity. Again, when you, when, you, when, you, when you use specialization as the key issue, then you don't retain and maintain uh, the, all of the varieties of biodiversity and genetic diversity, which give you the resources for local adaptation under these new disturbing consequences that we're going to see. So we need to now 
uh, not only restore the biological health of our soil, but also restore the biological diversity and the genetic diversity as a resource uh, to meet these, uh, these new challenges in the future. And then there's the loss of, of, of human capital, the loss of our farmers. This is not very well understood because we're still using a 1974 definition of the farm. But when you break this down, as of 2007 census data, 75% of our total agriculture sales were produced by just 192,442 farms in this country. And 30% of our farmers were over age 65 and only 6% are under age 35. Now, that's not very well known in, our pub in the public because it's not the, the statistics are never presented in that way. But when you present them in that way, I think that we've got a huge human capital problem uh, that we're going to have to be facing. Okay, so what are some of the, some of the, some of the elements in, in a resilience kind of thinking, in a resilience future that we ought to be thinking about? Well, first of all, we need to restore the biological health of our soil and we need to restore our biological diversity and our genetic diversity. That's a key factor because those are the fundamental resources that enable us to put a, a resilient system together. Secondly, uh, we need to restore or to transform uh, the, our uh, annual crops into perennial crops. And again, uh, we, there's always some good news here because there are some people that are attending to this. Uh, Wes Jackson at the Land Institute for the last 30 years now has been, through natural breeding, developing uh, perennial crops to uh, replace annual crops. And, uh, you know, he was demonized for a long time because biologists said, well, you know, if you're going to put, you know, plants either going to put their, their energy into root systems or into seeds, and if you're going to put into root system, you're never going to get the yield. Well, Wes understood somehow that biology was more complex than that, and he's now proven that, in fact, he's correct. And he now has already developed some varieties of wheat and uh, sorghum and other crops. Uh, the yield aren't quite where they are yet, but every, every growing cycle has increased. And uh, a number of us have projected now that if we were to put a modest amount of our current research dollars into developing these perennial plants, plants then by 50 years from now, 60% of our uh, annual cropland could be in perennials. And you think about resilience from that perspective. Perennial plants have root systems that go 15 to 18 feet down into the, into the soil rather than a, a 15, a 15 or 18 inches. So you have all of that resilience uh, uh, into the system. And my time is up here, so let me just, a couple of other things. Agroforestry, which is developing in many parts of the third world, uh, is another more resilient kind of system. Uh, and then permaculture, uh, which uh, was mentioned here a little bit earlier in terms of these complex systems of plants and animals in which the waste from one part of the system becomes the energy for the food for another part of the system. Those kinds of biological synergies have to be part of uh, a resilient future. Um, so uh, this, uh, I can't uh, tell you how important this is because uh, we can do without automobiles, we can do without uh, computers, and if we have to, we can do without underpants, we can't do without food. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, we have to deal with the issue of resilience now and building resilience into our food system. And again, the good news is uh, that we have some, some information uh, to go on, and I would encourage all of us uh, to do that. And if you have some uh, questions uh, or want to discuss this, I'll be around all day. I'd be happy to uh, have further conversations with you about it. Thank you.